The Roots of Success podcast is for the landscape professional who's looking to up their game. We're not talking lawns or grass here. We're talking about people, process, and profits. The things deep within the business that need focus to scale a successful company. From hiring the right people and managing your team, to improving your operations and mastering your finances, we've got a brain trust of experts to help you nurture the roots of a successful business and grow to the next level. This is the Roots of Success. Tommy here with McFarland Stanford. We have an awesome guest lined up for you today, Liz Helton. She is the leader of the bookkeeping team and financial services at McFarland Stanford. You're going to be so blown away by some of the topics we've got for you today. The 50-40-10 rule, it's super awesome to run your business. Also, we've got three buckets to measure and improve your financial statement. We've also got why you should close your books and lock them up for good in the previous months. Exciting to have probably one of the smartest people I know on our podcast, get her in the room and share her knowledge and expertise. Liz, real quick, what's what's some of your background? I know you stayed at a company for a long time. What was that experience like? Well, I have an experience mainly in big business. I went and worked for Ernst & Young, which is now one of the the top big four accounting firms globally. I very quickly realized that I actually enjoyed working with people more than companies. So I was a CPA, still am a CPA, but very quickly after joining them, I got my CFP license as well. That stands for Certified Financial Planner. And I was dealing primarily with big executive groups, wealthy families, you know, multi-generational wealth, and of course, a lot of business owners as well. I, I really like kind of getting smaller in a, in a big arena. So big business for what, 18, 19 years. And then this curveball came and it was known as Liz Helting General Contracting for the most part. What in yeah. the world was that all about? Well, I started a business. It was actually called Helton Residential. And I had the opportunity, it sort of fell in my lap to buy my neighbor's house. They were very, very elderly. Their house, I think they'd been in it for almost 50 years, hadn't really done a lot to it. It was, it was not in great shape. So I, I got it under contract, agreed to buy it. And then I went to my father-in-law who had built houses for decades and said, I'm gonna need your help here because we're gonna tear this down and put up a new house. And so I worked with him for about four years. We built a number of houses from you know scraping the yards to drop it in the landscape at the very end, sold them. They were all spec homes. And then my father-in-law retired and I was kind of in between things, wondering if I should stay in that, in that risky market. And that is when I met Jim Calli. So <laughs> you're, you're not from the green industry, right. as, as we can see, which is good. We need people like you in our industry to see the outside perspective. But working for the big four and then doing general contracting, you got to learn how to manage subcontractors, manage a deadline, manage the numbers, all that sort of thing. What's, what's something that you learned during that time frame that has benefited in what you do now? I think it really just gave me an appreciation for small business, yeah. which is where everybody starts. You know, it doesn't really matter what your industry is. Accounting and finance spans all industries. There's, you know, unique things that go on. And I've, I've certainly enjoyed learning all about the green industry. I, I pretty much learned something new every day, which is, is always fun. But I just really learned that as a small business owner, you do everything. I mean, I remember one Friday night, I found myself on my back in a bathtub screwing in hardware because something had to get done, you know, something was misdelivered and I was just like, well, I gotta do that. I also have to handle all of the legal work with the company. I'm doing, like you said, all the sub management and everything. You wear, you wear a lot of hats as a small business owner. Yeah, you know, I think everyone can relate to that. You know, we work with hundreds of small business owners. At the end of the day, you gotta roll up your sleeves and that's, if that's what financials, great. That's what you gotta do. And if it's putting a tree in the ground or, or whatever, it's gotta be done. So I love that aspect. Let's, let's get into a couple of things. We use this term called knowing your numbers all the time. It's sort of like the slang term that we've created, knowing your numbers. But for our audience, what does that mean? I think it's something different depending on where you are in the growth cycle of your business and really your background and how comfortable you are with numbers in general. I would say what 
100% of landscapers know is their top line. They know what they're selling, yeah. they know what they're producing, they know what they're billing, right? That's that top line in your p and it, It's your bragging rights, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a $2 million company, I'm a $20 million company. You know what's funny about that, Liz, is we're always judged by the top line, and that's the size of our business. Because we go around and go, well, it's not how many people you have. It's like, so how big are you? You're like, $2 million. Okay, that's what we all think of, right? But you could be a $2 million company that's completely unhealthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So it's all of the numbers that fit in between that top line revenue number and your net profit or loss at the very bottom that you really have to figure out what's important to me and my business. And when you start looking at a P&L, it can be pretty daunting. So what we generally talk to with business owners as we work through a P&L is we start focusing just on really big concepts and big ideas. We take that 30,000 foot perspective and say, okay, what can we see from here? And then as people get more comfortable with those big sections, those big ideas, the terminology becomes more you know, comfortable with them, then we can start talking about some of the individual line items and start narrowing the scope and what's really going to help tighten up all of your expenses so that at the end of the day, mathematically, it falls to hopefully what is a healthy net operating profit. Okay, let's, let's take a little deep dive. The P&L sheet, big grand scheme picture 30,000 foot elevation, I'm looking down on it. What's some big things to look at there? So the top, the number one there is your sales. That's what starts your, your profit and loss statement. Then you get to your first big bucket of expenses, which are your cost of goods sold. So everything that you have to spend to put that tree in the ground or to mow the yard or you know, you're paying people, you're buying materials, you're putting gas in your equipment, that type of stuff, those direct expenses. And when you subtract your cost of goods sold from your top line revenue, you get what's called gross profit margin. All of that gross profit margin together is what's left over to cover the second big bucket of expenses that a business faces, which are all of the indirect expenses. All of those things that you have to pay, really whether you're doing a lot of work or a little bit of work. Yeah. You know, Things like insurance, things like payroll expenses, your overhead payroll. And when you subtract both of those two big buckets of expenses, you get down to your net operating profit. And that's sort yeah. of the high level perspective. We like to talk about a 50, 40, 10. So if you think about it mathematically, right, you have 100% of your sales to, you either have to spend money to produce those. And if you spend less than you take in, you have a net operating profit. So if you think about your cost of goods sold representing about 50% of your sales, you're left with 50%. If you can manage to keep those indirect expenses at or below 40%, mathematically, you will end up with a 10% net operating profit, which is very healthy. It's a goal of a lot of green industry companies. It's a very hard target to hit. But if anything changes with the 50 or the 40, obviously your net operating profit is going to be impacted as well, either positively or negatively. So to recap, you have sales, then you have your COGS, and then you have your expenses, and then you have your net. Correct. Right? Okay. Yep. 50, 40, 10. I love that general rule. Oh, did you know what the industry average of net is what? 3%? It's about 3%. And, yeah. and you, and know, we, you know that the industry has thousands and thousands of, of very, very small mom and pop companies as well. And then you've got obviously all the big guys too. But that's kind of a razor thin margin for error if you think about it. People get in this industry one of two ways. One, they start pushing a mower one day, right? Or I start mowing as a young kid and they, they learn that aspect, but not knowing their numbers very much. Or they, a lot of people will buy into the business because they're like, man, landscaping is really simple and easy. It's mowing and putting <laughs> in shrubs, right? It's got to be in there going, oh my gosh, there's way more to it. It's a hard thing to consistently right? Month really? over month, quarter over quarter, season over season to, to hit that. Liz, let me ask you this. So say you've got a business, someone's out there and going, I don't have the 50, 40, 10. So my net is 3%. What do I got to do to get that net up to 10? What can I work on? 
Absolutely. You can always increase your top line by raising your prices, right? That's yeah. one option. We have seen sell people more. raise, sell, sell more, but if you're not selling work that you can perform profitably, that 3% will never change. So if you just charge more, right, and you continue to have all the same inputs, in theory, your net operating profit will increase. We've seen a lot of companies increase prices more than once over the past few years. We've been dealing with a lot of inflationary aspects, and certainly there was a period of time where wages were just kind of going up almost out of control, and there was no way to, to field a full crew or full staff without really matching market rates. So if we put aside raising prices and we say, you know, this is a market price, I just have to figure out how to do it better. I like to run a profit and loss statement with a percentage number down the right-hand side. So yes. income is your, your top line, it's 100%. And from there, you assign a percentage to every single category on your profit and loss statement. And then you end up with, we'll say hypothetically, a 3% net operating profit. Well, if you look at those percentages, you'll realize very quickly that there's only a few things that are significant enough that if you focus on them and improve those numbers, will have a massive impact on your business. So for right. example, in cost of goods sold, if you look down however many categories you have, you'll realize that direct labor is the biggest cost on the P&L above everything else, whether it's a direct or an indirect expense. And typically in this industry, we like to see that at or below 30%. So we saw that metric really go up. It got a little bit out of hand for a lot of companies because they were in a reactionary position. You know, they didn't raise their prices. They couldn't really increase their efficiencies, but their direct labor just kept going up because wages were rising. But if you can figure out how to manage your hours, right, to a budget so that you know that I'm bidding this job and it's 200 hours worth of work. And as long as my guys can do it in 200 hours or less, I'm good. You know, it's things like obviously estimating properly, but eliminating overtime unless you're taking that into account. But anything you can do to reduce windshield time, gas station stops, all of that unproductive or unbillable time can have a massive effect on that single biggest cost. So that's usually where we start with. If somebody doesn't have a direct labor number that's at or below 30% of their sales, it's something operationally that they really have to dig into and figure out how to improve. Yep. The other big categories in cost of goods sold are materials and subcontractors. And some people you know, use subs heavily, some do not. And materials, it really varies, but that's usually where we have the conversation about you have to mark up your materials, whether it's hardscape or softscape, on appropriate amount in order to produce that healthy 50% gross profit margin that we're targeting. Yeah. That's good. Those three big numbers there have the most impact on your net in the entire 100%, like you were saying, right? So labor right. materials and subs, that has the biggest effect. And you talk to the ACE members all the time about that. That Correct. There are certain things and expenses that don't move the wheel very much. Can you explain yeah, you're that a little bit? Sure. Sure. You could say we generally consider uniforms to be a direct expense, you know, because there's something that the crew goes out in to officially represent your business every day. And you might have a, a budget of half a percent, if you look at it, that you're spending on your uniforms, right? So you're like, I'm going to just slash my uniform budget. We're going to practically disposable stuff. It looks terrible. You know, it's not comfortable. And you really haven't moved the needle. You've saved hardly any money and, you know, nobody wants to wear your uniforms. <laughs> Plus, yeah. you probably look terrible. So that's not an area where you want to focus at all. I mean, you know, you do want to represent your company with your uniforms, but you don't want to look at that as a place where you can really save some money. Whereas if you start monitoring your hours, possibly providing incentives when budgets are, are met or exceeded, monitoring your overtime and things like that, you can, you can really make a big difference. That, that's what we find a lot is those numbers are the crucial things that you manage every day. Every and single day. Every single day. The P&L statement is the heartbeat of your business. I mentioned earlier, you may look great on the outside, but how are the internal functions of 
your body feeling, right? And so what do you go do? You go get a blood sample or a test, right? And you pull all that data up. In fact, I just did it this week. That's why I'm using that example. So <laughs> I got all my data back because I haven't done it in six months, but it gives you everything. It's like three pages worth of data that should be in these certain levels, high, low, and, or right on. And it gives me a game plan for myself, which, you know, Liz, I love the Work out, take care. I take it a little bit right. extreme. You probably you know that. Like your husband, right? Your husband's the same way. So I have a financial assessment basically of my body, right? But like most landscape companies don't have that. Tell the importance of getting the PL statement and getting it every month. Yeah. So the important thing I think when we when we talk about a PL, because I mean I look at these kind of all day long. And and generally what I see is that people want to put all of their expenses in so many buckets, we call it analysis yeah. paralysis, right? Because there's so many buckets that you can't figure out like, well, what should I focus on or what should I look at? And so there's kind of a fine line between, you know, trying to get every little penny in exactly the right bucket as opposed to having a little bit more broad categories. And what we, what we find is that if we can put more broad categories on the P&L, the details are still in the background. They're still there. You know exactly what goes into each bucket and you can slice and dice the buckets any way you want if you're interested in that data. From, but from a high level perspective, you really have to look at things a little bit more consolidated. So when we talk about indirect expenses, which again are that other bucket of costs, you have to think about how you could possibly save money there as well. And just like direct labor is your number one cost of goods sold, typically administrative and overhead payroll expenses, salaries, et cetera, are the biggest single indirect expense that a company will have. After that, it drops off significantly. Depending on what state you live in, insurance is oftentimes the second expense. And then you see things ranging everywhere from advertising to recruiting to professional development to you know, legal and professional fees. But those are, again, are really relatively small. So it's the things that you can really focus on for insurance. Of course, you have to be getting your policies rebid at least every other year, if not every year. We have yep. seen those, those fluctuate rapidly. Vehicle insurance, we just had a $5 million client. They saved $40,000 this year by rebidding their vehicle yep. insurance. That's not small wow. potatoes, but you know, wow. you stick around with the same company and they're going to keep charging you kind of what they were. There's really no incentive for them to reward you. Yeah, that's good. You know, I remember I was around in the 08, 09 recession and we created a, a quote that said, managed by the line item. And we would take those estimates as a project manager, operations manager, whatever it is, and we would literally manage each line atom of the estimate. If the estimate just said $10,000, people think there's just $10,000, right? That, sure. that, like, That's I'm a good. lot of money. I, yeah, I'm good. What we learned was if you manage the line item of 250 bucks and 500 bucks or $2,000, each line item you know, those two trees are 500 bucks, right? Those 500 shrubs are $2,000. And if you manage by the lot them and get those under budget, the rest is great, right? So it's kind of like managing your personal finances too. Yeah, I got a bucket of money, but if I review every, everything that comes in and understand it, then you're good, right? Yeah. Personal yeah. finance is a very good comparison because if you deal with young people, I've got some young, young adults in my life, you know, and you get out of college and you, you think like, Hey, this is how much money I'm making. It's so much money. But if you start tagging everything right for taxes and food and your rent and your car payments and insurance and all of those things, you realize that that, that gets eaten up pretty quickly. And if you blow a budget in any, you know, single month, you're going to feel it. And it's no different running a business or running a project, right? Yeah. You can have a mini P and L on any particular project. Your yeah. estimates should be designed to provide that gross profit margin to support the rest of the business operations. Yeah. And so, you know, if you are bidding accurately, so you can price accurately and then everything works as planned, which is obviously easier said than done, you know, that's the first, the first step is that planning. Liz, let's talk about closing your books and what that means. 
Explain the importance of closing your books and how often that should happen and why. Closing your books should happen monthly. And if you are doing everything monthly, you will find that a year-end close is really no different than a regular old month. So, you know, we kind of just got through tax season. It's fresh in people's minds and there should be no reason that you can't give your annual numbers to your tax preparer. Like I'd say by February 1st, maybe February 15th, if you're kind of doing a deep dive and reviewing stuff. If you've done that every single month for the entire year, you already know everything is accurate. So closing the books essentially means that once a month ends, you go through and you look at every number on your P&L. You also look at your balance sheet and you review it. You say, does this make sense? Have I captured everything? So every single credit card receipt should be recorded. There's no reason that you shouldn't have recorded every expense that you've charged on your credit card. You know, sometimes vendor invoices take a little bit longer to come in. Hopefully you have a relationship with your vendors where you're getting that more quickly so you can record those invoices. And then closing the books in our world actually means that you lock them. You digitally yeah. lock them. So that if anybody wants to go in after you close the books in April and change something for March, they have to put in a password in order to do that. And you don't give that password to very many people because what it should do, and I actually like it also, is it'll make me think, why am I going back and putting something into a month that in theory was already closed and I thought was accurate? There is the occasional, you know, acceptable reason to do that. But in general, you would just fix that and account for that in April. So closing the books literally means this is done. We're not going to go back and, you know, change things. We're not going to change the dates on things or the amounts. This is exactly a fair representation of what happened in the month of March. Yeah, very good. I, I, I'm a strong believer in that. It should take you, you know, definitely no longer than the whole following month depending on, you know, who you have doing that work for you, what their skill set is, you know, what their workload is like. I mean, we do have companies that can close their books in like seven days. Like record time. We worked on the same thing, but we always had a goal to hit the next month of when we should close because nothing's greater than having a deadline to get that stuff closed. It, when I was project manager, I was managing multiple projects hundreds of thousands of dollars. And guess what was the worst thing on record? Subcontractor invoices, right? You know, the worst sure. about getting your invoices and you can look at a p and statement three days after the previous month and things will look great. You're like, man, we're kicking butt. That's right. And then my, I remember our director of finance, he's like, did you get all your invoices in? I'm like, I don't know. He's like, there's no way this is right. We have 20% net profit and that's not gonna work. And you had to <laughs> right. really, Get these subs, which are mostly small companies, maybe mop and pop that give me your $25,000 invoice. I need it now so I can record it. Explain the importance of revenue and cost in the same month. The only way to really know if you're making money is to match the work that you're producing with all of the costs that go into producing that revenue. So generally things like payroll are in the month that you paid payroll. So that matches up with what you build in the month. What Tommy was really referring to earlier is, hey, you know, we had a pool sub come out and, you know, install a pool in the month of March. We haven't gotten the invoice until maybe the end of April. And so in the meantime, everything looks fantastic, but that vendor is really holding up your assessment of how much you really made on that construction project. And so when you amalgamate every single project, all the work that a company does, you wanna be able to put those in the same column and say, did I make a lot of money? Did I make a little bit of money or did I lose money? Yeah. And so, so getting that information quickly, I would say that that's typically what we see is that the subcontractors, the vendors that are maybe not as sophisticated as say a Weathermatic or a Ewing or a Site One, right? You're waiting for them to bill you. I always find it surprising that, you know, the smaller the company, the longer it takes them to bill you because in theory, they should be the most 
cash strap the most dependent on, hey, I did work for you this week. Can I get paid, you know, on Friday? That's typically what what we would see in the construction company. I mean, every Friday morning, I'm madly writing checks, right, to go get to the job site and hand them out. People want to be paid, you know, like, hey, I finished work 30 minutes ago. Where's my check? <laughs> but yeah. that's not always the case. But but lining up your income and expenses allows you to really tell exactly how profitable or unprofitable that work was. That's why it's important to have that P&L statement accurate as possible so you can move forward with your business and, and go from there. I got one question. Depreciation. We get asked depreciation yep. all the time. If You know what I'm talking about, right? I feel like every okay. meeting there's a discussion about this. Should it be included? Should it not? Yes. Depreciation should be on your yeah. P&L. The confusion typically arises because there's two different calculations for depreciation. There's a tax depreciation, which is just sort of like a benefit that the government gives you. But that's really not reflective of what's happening to your fixed assets. So you want to put on your profit and loss statement what's called book depreciation. And it is an approximation of the fact that everything that you have purchased, your trucks and your equipment, potentially even your buildings, are being used up over time. So I think the best example is probably, let's just say you buy a truck for $60,000. And we'll assume for simplicity of math that you're going to depreciate that truck over five years. Maybe you keep it seven. We know even after five years, it's going to have some residual value. But just, you know, again, this is supposed to be an approximation of the fact that you are consuming that truck in the course of your daily business. So over five years, that 60 months, you would record $1,000 a month in depreciation on that truck over a five-year period. That just really kind of aligns what you know is happening in your business. The tax depreciation, which you kind of want to ignore, would say, hey, I'm, I'm going to depreciate all $60,000 worth of that truck the year you buy it, because that gives you a tax break. Great, I'm all for tax breaks. You wanna accelerate those. You don't wanna pay the government a dollar more than you have to. But what that means is that your P&L looks terrible. You just took a $60,000 expense in a single month, the month that you bought mm -hmm. the truck. Well, you know, it's really kind of hard to recover right. from that accounting wise, right? It, it makes it look like a terrible month. The flip side of that is that then you have a truck that you know you own it's practically new or it's a year or two old, but on your balance sheet, it's represented at zero because you've already depreciated yeah. the other truck. And you don't want that either, right? Because it's important to have a healthy balance sheet that shows truly what does this company own and the opposite of that, what does this company owe? So if you're looking to get financing for any type of loan or potentially you're looking to sell your business, you want a healthy balance sheet as well as a healthy profit and loss statement. So book depreciation is the way to get there. It yeah. does not have to be perfect, but that's conceptually what's behind depreciation and why it's important. In essence, it somewhat mirrors what you would pay if you were leasing vehicles and equipment, right? You'd have monthly expenditures of actual cash to have those assets available to you. It's a little bit different when you yeah. purchase it, but depreciation is kind of a comparable calculation. We get asked that a lot. I think. I think owners are hesitant about doing it because it takes their net down, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. But, you know. But it, it's yeah. it's proper books, and that's what you want. It is, and it's a little bit like kicking the can down the road, right? If you don't yeah. take depreciation, well, then what happens when you have to buy a new vehicle? Like, how do you account yeah. for that? At some point, you have to account for it. And so... Well, it makes the most sense to say, yeah, we're using our trucks every single day, so we're gonna just depreciate them over time. If you're scared to put that depreciation, then I think you need to work on the big three, which is labor, material, <laughs> and subcontractors like we spoke about, right? That's right, That'd be that's wild. right. Would... Yep, yep, and you know, depreciation can just also give you a sense of how how old are all of my assets you know if you have really high depreciation of course it's going to affect your your net profit but it also means that you have newer or newish vehicle and equipment if it's really really small it means you've depreciated all of that stuff already <laughs> 
And, you know, you're likely about to have to, to replenish or replace some of those assets. As we wrap up, Liz, I'm sitting here thinking, if you're a new business owner or you're young and people ask me all the time, like, what would you do differently if, if you were to get a business going? I would so recommend you partnering with somebody or getting someone good that can do your bookkeeping. Okay. Here's where I'm going. It's because it's going to give you a lot of ammunition for years to come to make sure your books are correct. And that's what everyone forgets. They're often racing to get the big machine, the brand new truck, the new facility and the swag gear and all this. But at the end of the day, you can only get all that stuff if you've got the correct P&L and your books are all in order every single month. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, the financial statements are really just a scorecard. And they're really going to, if they are accurate, they will provide you with valuable information so you can make those business decisions, right? Yeah. Can I hire another foreman? Can I afford another truck? You know, everybody knows you have to invest in your business for growth. But there is something to be said. If you are not making money, it's going to be very hard for you to pay for those investments over time. So I really look at the numbers as sort of the beginning and the end, but really only for purposes of figuring out, okay, what is my business doing? How can I make it better? One of the things that we talked about last year, really for the first time at ACE Summit when we were all in Napa, we, we did a, a presentation over all of the ACE groups and just some big picture type stuff with them. And what really struck me is we added up all of the vehicles that all of yeah. the ACE group members uh, owned at, at the time of the last reporting. And it was like well over 3,000 vehicles. And then we added up the number of members on their team, which was extensive. I don't remember off the top of my head the exact number. But you think about the number of people that you impact as a business owner, right? And it's not just those people, it's their family, it's their children. And so if you think about like, I'm building this business for opportunity, opportunity for myself and opportunity for other people, you really have to be smart and understand that really money talks. The only way to continue doing that is to continue to be profitable. And so yeah. even if you're a kid, right, and you're out there mowing a lawn, you have to think, well, did I buy the lawnmower or am I leasing the lawnmower maybe from mom and dad? And then like they're making me buy my own gas for it, right? So if I spend X dollars, you know, mowing like the five neighbors grass, am I making money or is this like, am I doing this basically for free? So, you know, you can boil it down to real, real simple things. And I think what we see the most with smaller businesses is that they just aren't considering all of the costs of doing business because not all costs are something that, that you see regularly. And so their pricing just isn't sufficient in order to cover all those costs and still be profitable, which yeah. is again, okay. where if you have somebody who is keeping track of all that stuff and, and, you know, I'm not a landscaper, but I can definitely tell you if I think there's an issue with one of those line items on your, on your P and L sure. I'm going to, you know, boot you over to Tommy and say, Hey, Tommy, tell them how they can, how they can improve this <laughs> as yeah. the operations person, yeah. you know, how yes. do you fix the problem? Yes. Love it. Love it. Liz, there is a quote that you've mentioned for a long time since I've known you. And I I'm going to recite this because I think this sums up everything. You'd probably be like, I can't believe I've said that, or I've said it a hundred times. I didn't even know it. <laughs> I think this sums up everything. It says big decisions can't be made without accurate and timely financial statements. That and that's absolutely. what we just talked about, right? That, mm -hmm. that's, that's the name of the game is you've got to have that statement prepared and it's gotta be accurate and on time in order to make decisions. Sure. Love yeah. It. If you're not confident in your numbers, in that what you are seeing on paper is correct, you might as well just throw darts at a dartboard, right? Because yeah, I mean, you, like they could be better, they could be worse. It's like nobody knows. And, and you know, if you don't have those things turned in timely, you as a business owner, there's a lot of things that happen on a daily and weekly basis, and you have to be able to pivot and respond to those. And if you don't have numbers that can help you assess situations and make a decision. You know, it doesn't help what happened three months ago. Like that's water under the bridge. Nobody cares, right? right? 
a lot of things can have changed in three months. And in, in what do you do if you don't have current data? Thank you so much for joining us and giving us your perspective in the financial world. Once again, she is the smartest person in the room by far. So I love to partner with people like that, that know their stuff, right? I know the operations side and she knows the financials. So I think we work hand in hand. I think we can see it. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure, Liz. Thanks for having me, Tommy. Ready to take the next step? Download our free profitability scorecard to quickly create your own baseline financial assessment and uncover the fastest ways to improve your business. Just go to McFarlandStanford.com slash scorecard to get yours today. To learn more about McFarland Stanford, our best-in-class peer groups, and other services, go to our website at McFarlandStanford.com. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. See you next time on The Roots of Success.